Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. During the Democratic presidential debate in Florida between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, both candidates were asked about their position towards Cuba. In the course of their answers, Sanders referred to the US history of US interventionism in Latin America and to the Monroe Doctrine. Here's a clip. That the United States was wrong to try to invade Cuba that the United States was wrong trying to e support people to overthrow the Nicaraguan government, that the United States was wrong trying to overthrow in 1954 the government, democratically elect elected government of Guatemala. Throughout the history of our relationship with Latin America, we've operated under the so-called Monroe Doctrine. And that said that the United States had the right to do anything that they wanted to do in Latin America. So I actually went to Nicaragua, and I very strongly opposed the Reagan administration's effort to overthrow that government. And I strongly opposed earlier uh, Henry Kissinger uh, and the, uh, to overthrow the government of Salvador Allende in Chile. I think the United States should be working with governments around the world not get involved in regime change. And all of these actions, by the way, in Latin America, brought forth a lot of very strong anti-American sentiments. The complaint that Sanders raised about US interventionism is one that Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, raised yesterday too, when he decided to withdraw Venezuela's highest diplomat in the US, there is no ambassador at the moment, in reaction to President Obama's recent renewal of a decree that declares Venezuela to be an ex extraordinary threat to US national security. With us today to discuss what is going on in Venezuela and in US-Venezuela relations is Steve Elner. Steve is Professor Emeritus of, the, of History from the Universidad del Oriente in Venezuela, where he has lived for over 40 years. He's most recently author of Rethinking Venezuelan Politics. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Sure, well, thanks for having me on, Greg. So let us start first with uh, this idea uh, or this uh, complaint that uh, President Maduro recently uh, raised with regard to uh, the, uh, the renewal of this decree that uh, Obama renewed recently saying that uh, Venezuela is a, represents a threat to national security. What's, behind, what's going on in U.S.-Venezuela relations? I mean, what would you say this means, the fact that he's withdrawing it and that Obama recently uh, renewed this decree? I think, uh, firstly, to, to place that, Greg, in, in uh, historical context, you know, after the uh, end of the Gold War in 1991, a lot of people felt that U.S., the history of U.S. intervention during the Cold War, that extended period from World War II to uh, 1991, that the U.S. would maintain a different position, a position in support of democracy and non-intervention. Uh, that obviously hasn't happened in a lot of cases, at least. And in the case of Venezuela in particular, uh, the United States had, has played a very direct and indirect role uh, in Venezuelan politics, beginning with the uh, coup in 19, in 2002, which the United States supported, um, although there's a lot of controversy as to what that support actually consisted of. Um, and since then, the United States has uh, supported the Venezuelan opposition. A lot of uh, financial support has gone to the opposition. Uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, for instance, uh, which extended limited support to political parties and political groups and social groups in Venezuela prior to Chavez's advent to power, uh, became the number one recipient of economic uh, support from the Indi uh, National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, so that uh, the U.S. position has, throughout this uh, 16, 17-year period of Chavista rule, uh, has been uh, quite uh, quite um, uh, evident. Uh, with regard to the Obama order, order, which states that Venezuela is an unusual and extraordinary threat to U.S. security, it's really hard to take it seriously. I mean, there's really no evidence to that effect. 
And it would seem that uh, the order is really meant to create uh, uh, an atmosphere, a um, you know, public opinion in the United States uh, 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 in favor of the opposition at a time when the opposition uh, ha did well in the recent elections for the National Assembly and is calling for the ouster of the Maduro government. So at this particular moment, uh, it would seem as if the order is really meant to strengthen the position of the opposition, uh, especially when it comes to U.S. public opinion. So, um, and the other thing that, of course, I mean, one of the things that's coming up in, in Venezuela is, uh, we'll, we'll get into that later, but uh, the whole plan that the opposition has for ousting Maduro. But uh, one of the things that they're also, that's very high on their agenda is this um, law of amnesty that where they're trying to um, allow um, or trying to free everyone who has recently been imprisoned uh, during the uh, Chavez and Maduro governments that in any way was connected to politics. How is that, is that in any way connected? Is that also giving legitimacy to the opposition? That is, the, is the U.S. giving legitimacy to the opposition in uh, its effort to basically give an amnesty like this, a blanket amnesty to anyone practically who was involved in any kind of demonstration, no matter what kind of um, damage they did or who they even might have killed, actually? Yeah. The, the, I think the point to uh, emphasize is that from the very outset, the call for the liberation of so-called political prisoners that was a banner of the opposition uh, and was supported by the White House, the uh, State Department, the spokespeople for the U.S. government, uh, called on the Venezuelan government to liberate political prisoners. Uh, at no moment was any differentiation made between prisoners who were imprisoned because of acts of violence and prisoners who were imprisoned because of other actions. And specifically, Greg, Back in uh, two years ago, in 2014, there was a period of between three and four months of uh, civil disobedience and violence in Venezuela. It's called the Guarimba. That's the term uh, that's used here in Venezuela. It took place between February and May of 2014. And during that period, you didn't have any uh, legal protests. All the protests were illegal. Uh, but you had two sets of protests. One was civil disobedience, in which the protesters were blocking traffic, uh, you know, shutting down uh, traffic, building barricades, and that kind of thing. And then there was the violent protests, which involved destruction of uh, public property, uh, uh, nearly all the metro stations in the eastern wealthy part of Caracas were heavily damaged. Uh, nearly 100 metro buses were heavily damaged. Um, uh, federal buildings were damaged. Cuban doctors were attacked. There were about 150 cases of reported cases of Cuban doctors who were attacked. So this was the violent side of this campaign to oust Maduro from the presidency. Now, it would appear that the call for the liberation of any prisoner who was involved in nonviolent civil disobedience uh, is quite different from the call for the liberation of those prisoners who are, who are being accused of abetting, promoting, or being involved directly in acts of violence. No differentiation was made either on the part of the opposition or the part of the U.S. government. Uh, and that's the case now with this law of amnesty. No differentiation is made between those who are accused of acts of violence and those who uh, are in prison as a result of civil disobedience. Hmm. And it seems interesting, though, that, um, I mean, the opposition is calling them, obviously, political prisoners. And the U.S. is, in effect, doing the same thing in, uh, in supporting the opposition. Um, and uh, it seems that uh, they have uh, no criticism whatsoever of, of letting people go who were involved in violent protest. Uh, or do you see any indication there that, uh, that the U.S. is in any way kind of hesitant to support what the opposition is doing? No, uh, when it comes to the banner of the liberation of political prisoners, uh, no, no, there, as I said before, there is no differentiation 
between these two sets of prisoners. In fact, it's even unclear uh, who's who with regard to the uh, people in prison. But obviously, many of the prisoners uh, are being accused of acts of violence. And not only acts of violence, but uh, uh, shootings. Uh, there were 43 people who were killed. And you know, Greg, uh, in the United States, when uh, a police person is killed, that, that, that is a particularly serious offense. Somebody who kills a, a, police, a police officer uh, doesn't get off, I mean, you know, probably will be executed if in that state there's uh, uh, capital punishment. Uh, you know, in, in the U.S. they call them cop killers, and that's the worst of worst. Um, now, there were six uh, National Guards people who were killed during these demonstrations, six. Uh, and so it seems to me that uh, by not differentiating or not specifying exactly who should be freed, uh, this, as you call it, this blanket kind of amnesty uh, is really taking in people who were involved in acts of, of violence. Well, we've run out of time for the first segment, uh, but join us uh, for the second segment where we'll talk about the opposition's plans on uh, getting rid of Maduro. Uh, we'll be right back. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us at therealnews.com.